Grace and peace in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is such a joy to welcome you to this online worship experience as a part of Blacksburg United Methodist Church. My name is Brad Delaney. I'm one of the pastors here, and along with Pastor Jennifer Fletcher, we welcome you to our Church Street campus to this time of virtual online worship. If you're joining us today, perhaps for the first time, or if you're newer to our online worshiping community, we would love to know who you are. There's a link for you to click that will take you to a form where you could share some information. We'd love to have that so that we can extend our hospitality to you. We have a gift that we'd love to share with you, so uh, please take a moment to do that if you would. As a part of our bridge towards in-person worship, I'm excited to announce that on Wednesday, November the 4th, we are going to be hosting our first drive-in communion service. We'll be offering it at 12 o'clock noon and at 5.30 p.m. that Wednesday. And we hope to do this every first Wednesday of the month, as weather permits, as an opportunity for people to gather. It'll be, there will be a required pre-registration, and there are a lot of other restrictions that come as a part of participating in the service, including the requirement that you bring your own communion elements with you. You'll find fuller information by clicking on the link that's available here. This is a way for you to get the information that you need so that hopefully you can come and be a part of this new experience of worship for us as we continue to build the bridge towards in-person worship at Blacksburg United Methodist Church. Please join with me in the call to worship. You can participate with the words that appear on your screen. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Please join with me in the opening prayer. You can pray along with the words as they appear on your screen. Let us pray. A wisdom on high, by you the meek are guided in judgment, and light rises up in darkness for the godly. Grant us in all doubts and uncertainties the grace to ask what you would have us do, that we may be saved from all false choices, and that in your light we may see light, and in your straight path may not stumble. Through Jesus Christ our Savior. Amen. Today we're going to try an experiment to see what it looks like when we do good things or kind acts for others. And we're going to do that by looking at this bowl of water and we're going to use some different items and different objects and we're going to put them in the bowl of water and see what kind of splash it makes. And we're going to see if the bigger objects or the smaller objects 
make a splash. So the first one we're gonna do is this rock right here. It's a pretty normal size rock, a pretty good size rock. And this is gonna be like, if you do something for someone, um, a big something like you mow their whole yard or you walk their dog for like a week. You see how much the water moved? Okay. Then this tea bag is like a regular sized good thing. Like you make somebody a card and you mail it to them. And that made some bubbles. Okay. And this Q-tip is another regular sized thing like taking a treat to someone. And that made some ripples. Now, here are some marshmallows, and we're gonna use a few marshmallows. So say these are a few friends, and they are trying to cheer up one of their other friends, so they tell some funny jokes. This is like a medium-sized act of kindness or doing something good. Look how much that moved the water. And then we have these tiny little beads. And these are small, what we think are small little things, like smiling or holding the door for somebody. We're gonna use a whole bunch of them, like a whole lot of people are gonna do these. So we're gonna see how much that moves the water. of little bubbles there with those. So even the small things when they all worked together made ripples in the water. Very cool. Clay Jennings is one of the young people who are a member of our church doing marvelous work of ministry in the community. Clay approached our children's ministry a few months ago saying, I would love to do a virtual Sunday school this fall for the children of our church. He's calling it Bible sleuthing with Mr. Clay, and I'll let him explain it more. Hey guys, I'm Mr. Clay. I'm super excited to be telling you guys about something that's going to be happening soon. We're going to be doing virtual Sunday school, and it's going to be called Bible sleuthing with Mr. Clay. And we're going to learn about Old Testament people and we're gonna be detectives. That's what sleuthing is. We're gonna be detectives and learn more and more about these people that we don't get to learn about very often. So for this video, I'm gonna be telling you a little bit about all the things that we're gonna be doing. And while I'm talking, Bible verses and passages are gonna be showing up all around me. And they're gonna be telling you where in the Bible to go look for these people that we're gonna be learning about. Cause I'm not gonna tell you who they are yet. And they're gonna, not be exactly where to find them, but you will be able to figure out who they are. So, for example, the first person that we're going to be learning about is a woman named Hannah. And she's going to show up, her Bible story is going to show up on the screen, and it's going to say 1 Samuel 1 through 5. Now, really, her story is just chapters 1 and 2. But to keep it a little fun for you guys to have to go figure out who it is, we're going to do five chapters instead. So I'm super excited for you guys to figure those out. Now, during this time, we're going to be doing detective work, which means we're going to be trying to figure out who these people are, what they were like, what they did, and how God used them for the better part of Israel's history. Now, I'm also going to be talking about Jesus because Jesus is the most important. So we're going to be connecting their stories to Jesus, and we're going to be doing some detective work on how that looks. Now, we're also going to have some fun. I might be doing some science experiments. One story has fire in it, and we might be doing some fun things with fire. I'm also, I might make some food for you, and you guys watch me make some food, because one person's story involves food. Another time, I might take you on a hike with me, because one of the people's stories involves going through a new land. And like I said, I am super stoked about all of this happening, and it's starting Bible sleuthing with Mr. Clay, starting on the kids' YouTube channel for Blacksburg United Methodist Church. Stay tuned for that. 
and be looking for who these people are. I really hope you'll tune in and I'm really, really happy that we get to do this together because some of these people are the coolest people in the Bible to me. So I hope to see you there. See ya. I'm so grateful for people like Clay who take the initiative to try to bless uh, the children of our community. It's people like this and ministries like this that inspire me to want to give, to continue to support what God is doing in and through Blacksburg United Methodist Church. And as our music ministry is about to share a blessing with all of us, I would invite us to bless God in return by giving back God's tithe and our offerings. You can click the link to go to our Easy Tithe page, or you can just mail a check or drop it by the church office. Either way, let us worship God by giving back. Scripture lesson for today, second chapter of James, verses 5 through 17. Listen, my dear brothers and sisters, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and inherit the kingdom he promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor. 
Is it not the rich who are exploiting you? Are they not the ones who are dragging you into court? Are they not the ones who are blaspheming the noble name of him who you, to whom you belong? If you really keep the royal law found in Scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing right. But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. For he who said, you shall not commit adultery, also said, you shall not murder. If you do not commit adultery, but do commit murder, you have become a lawbreaker. Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom. Because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or a sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, not accompanied by action, is dead. The word of God to the people of God. One morning this week, as a part of our first five on Facebook, Pastor Jennifer read these words that were assigned for the day from Psalm 72. Give the king your justice, O God. May he judge your people with righteousness. May the mountains yield prosperity for the people. May he defend the cause of the poor and give deliverance to the needy and crush the oppressor. May he live while the sun endures. And as long as the moon throughout all generations, may he be like rain that falls on mown grass, like showers that water the earth. In his days may righteousness flourish and peace abound until the moon is no more. As she read these words, it struck me, these are such a contrast between these words in this prayer for the king and, and this acrimonious election season that we're in <laughs> where both our president and all the political opponents are slinging mud on each side of the other this psalm is a reminder to me that regardless of how messy and unholy things have become in our electoral politics there is another way and it is up to us as the voting citizens of this great nation to be wise in who we elect and in how we conduct ourselves through the election season. This is why we're doing this worship series called Discerning Democracy, Finding Grace in the Election. Through this series, I hope to first explore some guiding principles for our decision-making as we go into the election booth this fall, and secondly, to find ways to maintain our overall well-being, our mental, emotional, spiritual health, uh, during the pandemic and the selection season. The theme verse for this is Romans chapter 12, verse 2, which says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds, so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Now last week we looked into this rule of doing no harm and how it is helpful in the process of discernment. Today, the rule we're going to focus on is do good. And what Paul says here is doing what is good and acceptable and perfect. How can this rule of doing good guide our discernment as well as improve our individual and our corporate well-being as people of God? Well, let's look first at how this principle of doing good can help us in evaluating candidates for public office. You know, I think it's important to choose leaders not only by the policies that they stand for, but also, just as importantly, what is the person's just personality, their temperament, the values, their moral compass by which they live their life? Are they effective? Are they trustworthy? Are they strong? Are they humble? You know, different ones of us are going to have different opinions about what characteristics are important for us 
as we think about our elected officials, and, and that's okay. But I want to propose a simple measure. Does this person seek to do good, to serve the nation and the people that they lead? Is their heart and is their character in the right place? And in what ways do they, through their actions, seek to serve the common good? The letter that we call the book of James is, I think, a helpful guide in understanding this measure. We hear today James chapter 2, and I'll begin with verse 5. Listen, my beloved brothers and sisters. Listen. I have to say, as a parent, I have moments when I realize my child is talking to me, but I find myself not hearing a word that they're saying. I am not listening. I'm a bit like the voice of the teacher sometimes in Charlie Brown. What others are saying comes across as, mwah, 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 mwah. <laughs> and that's how it is for many of us today. Uh, you know, there's so much we're being inundated with that, it becomes difficult to really listen to each other, especially if what you expect to hear is remotely uncomfortable or maybe not what you want to hear. We just kind of plug our ears and say, well, I don't want to hear that. The question that that raises for me is, do we want political leaders who reflect this as well? Listen, my beloved brothers and sisters, has not God chosen the poor in the world to be rich in faith, to be heirs of the kingdom, that he may promise to those who love him, but you have dishonored the poor. Is it not the rich who oppress you? Is it not they who drag you into court? Is it not they who blaspheme the excellent name that was invoked over you, the name of Jesus? James, no doubt, saw in the early Christian communities a partiality towards the rich and a converse oppression or an overlooking of those who were in poverty. He's calling out their inherent bias towards people of means, towards people with power and prominence and influence. He's calling this out, that sometimes followers of Jesus focus on the, quote, important people while overlooking those who are on the margin. But let me ask you, where are you more likely to find Jesus? <laughs> It goes on to say in verse 8, You will do well if you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. Partiality, favoring one group of people over another, is sin. And in truth, when we are partial to those people we like or to the people who are like us, then our relationship with God is put out of kilter. It's disjointed, it's smudged, it's marred. That's what sin is. And because partiality is choosing some of the neighbors that you're going to love and some of the ones who are you going to other, who are you going to kind of disown as your neighbors, that's what causes it to be sin. It puts us out of joint in our relationship with God and with other people. Do you remember the day that the lawyer was debating with Jesus around the question of just who is my neighbor? It was in Luke chapter 10. When the lawyer asked, who is my neighbor, Jesus then told the wonderful story of the Good Samaritan. That in the end, it doesn't matter who or what kind of person the neighbor is. If it's someone in need, then you and I are called to be a neighbor, to serve that person. The royal law, as James puts it here, that we are called to fulfill is to love your neighbor as yourself. In other words, James is bringing us back, just as Jesus did, to the very heart of God's law, which I propose is something that we should like to see at the heart of any public servant. Does this person love their neighbor as him or herself? Do they seek to do good? Do they serve the common good? How might you and I begin to discern and to measure these kind of qualities in the candidates? 
Well, I like to think of an election as like an extended public job interview. <laughs> yeah, policies are part of it, and we talked about that last week, but just as important, I think, is the person themselves, what they bring, what sets them apart, what their personality, their strengths are. Framing it as a job interview, let's use a measure that's widely used among HR departments in the world around us, and that's behavioral interviewing. And this is a hiring philosophy that says the best way to discern a candidate's character is to look at their past behaviors. In other words, not what they say, but how they have functioned in real life and dealing with real situations. And so you ask what are called behavior-based questions as you're interviewing someone to help the candidate to share concrete, specific examples of how they've handled various real-life scenarios. So instead of saying to the candidate, what would you do if X happened? Instead, you ask, tell me about a specific time when X happened. How did you respond to that? The best way to discern someone's character or their temperament or their capabilities is to look at past behavior. It's the most consistent measure of what will indicate what we can expect from that person in the future. Now, in the context of an election, I, I think we look at a candidate's history, their track record, not only of the policies and the legislation that they've supported, but also the ways in which they get things done the ways they interact and function with other people. This is similar to the approach taken here by James. Later in verse 14, he comes to these powerful words. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith but do not have works? Can faith save you? If a brother or sister is naked and lacks daily food and one of you goes and says to them, go in peace, keep warm, eat your fill, and yet you do not supply their bodily needs. What is the good of that? So faith by itself, if it has no works, is dead. James is saying it doesn't matter what you say. What really matters are your actions. Anyone can talk a good talk, but when we're looking to evaluate what's really at the heart of a person, whether it's someone we know personally or a public candidate for office, it's all about what they do. Is there consistency? Is there integrity between what the person professes with their lips and demonstrates with their lives? Now, this leads to a whole line of questioning that should be Really, I think our approach in evaluating each candidate's character. We ask questions like, does this person serve the public good? Do they do what is right? Do they treat people justly and equitably? Do they work with the other side of the aisle? Do they follow through on what they promise to do? Do they get things accomplished? Do they listen to all sides? Do they stand up for what is right? Do they seek to compromise in order to make progress? Do they remain cool under fire? Do they engender people's trust? James says, do you really want to know whether someone has faith? Well, look at their life. Look at their works. That's a better way to evaluate character than what they say. Because words are cheap. What really matters are our actions. Does this person truly do what is good? Doing good. What a beautiful, simple principle by which we can not only judge the character of candidates, but also a simple rule by which we can find life and find peace amid this season of pandemic and election, uh, electoral mudslinging, I might say. What we call forth from our leaders, I think at some level we need to expect from ourselves, honestly. And, and more importantly, if you want to hold on to your mental health amidst this pandemic, then one of the things that we can do to help is, is simply to do good, to try to serve someone else, to bless and help someone else. As I was talking to someone earlier this week, they said, you know, it's like what John Wesley said, 
do all the good that you can by all the means you can and all the ways that you can and all the places you can at all the times you can to all the people you can as long as ever you can. Do good. It's a beautiful, simple principle that brings such life and joy. Now, I want to pause and just give a little caveat because I know some of you already are doing a lot of good and perhaps all the good you can. And I'm thinking many of you, because of the line of work that you're in, maybe you're a police officer or a first responder or a medical professional, maybe you're a counselor, a therapist, an educator, the list could go on and on. Some of you are spending countless hours of doing good in very challenging and stressful times. And if this is you, then maybe you should go back and re-listen to last week's sermon about doing no harm because chances are you need to take the time to take care of yourself. But you know, there are also others of us who are finding ourselves maybe with more time on our hands but feel a little bit helpless amid the election and the pandemic to be a part of something greater than ourselves. So if that's you, hear again these words from James. You do well if you really fulfill the royal law according to Scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. We looked at this, the greatest commandment, last week and how it calls us to do no harm. But this week, James is pointing out that it's also about doing good for and with other people. And, and come back with me to these familiar words James says. You know, what good is it? My brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith, but do not have works. You know, if a brother or a sister is naked and lacks daily food, and one of you says, go in peace, keep warm, eat your fill, and yet you do not supply their bodily needs, what is the good of that? So faith by itself, if it has no works, is dead. You know, what is love if it has no action? What is faith if it's never really lived out in concrete acts of loving service? Love is not some abstract theological construct to which we give our intellectual assent. <laughs> love is more than just the warm feelings you get when you see someone that you have affection for. No, Love is showing up and doing what needs to be done to help people, regardless of even how you feel about them. Love isn't truly realized until it's given itself away in acts of service. It's why God came among us in human flesh through Jesus Christ. You know, through Jesus, God touched the untouchable, fed the hungry, healed those who were sick, clothed the naked, and broke bread with sinners just like you and me and ultimately this outpouring of love put jesus on a cross where he ultimately emptied himself entirely out of love for you and for me to to restore us in our relationship with god's own self so we can know confidently that we are saved by grace through faith this saving love is it a, it is a free gift. It, we receive it by faith. And, as James says, that faith, without it being lived out, without us really having skin in the game, is not really a living thing. I like the word trust, which is another way of translating that word faith. Trust is an abiding faith-filled relationship. And when we trust, it necessarily leads us to action because trust is rooted relationally and grounded in love. Now, as we face the challenges that we have right now in front of us, everything from pandemic to the racism and, uh, and just the struggles with this election, there's a temptation to want to withdraw. And yes, Sometimes we, we need to do that for our own safety and our own well-being. But we must also invest ourselves in doing the good. Coming alongside those who are struggling. Showing up to help out our neighbor. I and mean, that's a beautiful thing. 
And it, help, it can help us to stay connected to our own true selves and help us to stay connected to others and to our community. Because if all we do is to withdraw from public life, if we kind of circle the wagons, our community and our lives, they're diminished. So let's just do small things. Go donate blood. You know, uh, it's frustrating that in some ways we lack a lot of the face-to-face opportunities to volunteer and serve. But because of COVID, many opportunities to go and to serve have been limited. But we can still donate blood. And it's still important that we seek opportunities to show up and to serve. Yes, money and giving and support are important, but to simply serve in simple ways, to help people out, to call in a neighbor to check on them like our VMC friends are doing, is such a precious gift. You're offering up blessing, but also opening yourself to receive God's grace in return as you bless another person. A few weeks ago, uh, we were kind of having a challenging week, as you might imagine, in my household. uh, Two working parents, both professionals, and uh, four children at home. Uh, going to three different schools uh, and the schools each on different weird schedules. It's been difficult and challenging just to orchestrate our our week-to-week, day-to-day life. And there are times when it feels a little overwhelming. My mom popped by one night. It was an evening when we had both gotten home from, my wife and I had gotten home from work, and my mom showed up with a pot of chili and cornbread <laughs> And uh, she said, you know, I just, I wanted to do something to bless you all and to help you. And I felt just a a little dumbfounded. I didn't know quite how to express my deep sense of gratitude. And and I said, well, you know, Mom, you didn't need to do this. We could have been fine with leftovers. And she said, well, you know what, Brad? It just brought me joy to do this for you. It brought me joy to do this for you. Friends, when we serve other people, it brings us joy. You know, it's not enough right now that we just do no harm. It's not enough that people's rights aren't trampled on. We're also obliged to do what is good, to to give of ourselves, investing our lives, our resources into the good, to blessing the people around us. Because ultimately it means it's good for the whole, for the building up of our community and of our society. Do no harm, do good. These are the first two general rules of the Methodist societies outlined by John Wesley himself, our founder. Now there's a third rule that we'll look at next week. But these rules are simple but substantial and substantive rules that can guide our choices in the election and and as we seek to stay healthy amidst this time of strangeness. There are also these rules through which God's grace flows into our lives and flows into our world. They are life-giving rules. When you and I can do small things to get outside of our own heads and, and to get into the life of our neighbors, My prayer is that you and I may discover the gift that God was seeking to give us all along. It is my prayer that as we seek to do good, as we seek to discern the good, that we may find Christ. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. What a joy it is within the body of Christ when we get to welcome a new brother or sister into our fellowship. And today we have the joy of doing that as we welcome Mike Weaver into our midst. Mike is coming by certificate of transfer from another United Methodist Church. He lives here in the Blacksburg community on Village Way. Some of you may be a neighbor of his. So just wanted to mention that so you have a sense of where he's coming from. Also, he serves as the executive director of the Bradley Study Center at Virginia Tech. He's currently also pursuing doctoral studies at the University of Winchester in the UK. And he's connected here through a Soul Connect group and also one of our Sunday school classes. So.
So he's uh, already made his way into uh, becoming a part of the relational body of Christ here at Blacksburg United Methodist Church. Mike, I have a few questions for you. And by answering these questions, you reaffirm your faith. On behalf of the whole church, I ask you, do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world, and repent of your sin? If so, please say, I do. Do you accept the freedom and power God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? If so, please say, I do. Do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior, put your whole trust in his grace, and promise to serve him as your Lord in union with the church which Christ has opened to people of all ages, nations, and races? If so, please say, I do. And as you come and join with the people of Blacksburg UMC, I want to ask this question, which is of your commitment to our church and the mission God has given us here. As a committed member of Blacksburg United Methodist Church, will you faithfully participate in its ministries by your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness? If so, say, I will. Friends, as we welcome Mike into this congregation, I want to invite you to participate using the words that appear in bold on your screen. Members of the household of God, I commend Mike to your love and care. Do all in your power to increase his faith, confirm his hope, and perfect him in love. We, we give, give thanks, thanks for all that God, God has already, already given you as we welcome you in Christian love, as members together with you in the body of Christ and in this congregation of the United Methodist Church, we renew our covenant faithfully to participate in the ministries of the church by our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service, and our witness that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. And Mike, I just want to say a word of gratitude and blessing to you as a fellow disciple here in the body of Christ at Blacksburg UMC, but also your witness in our community as a leader uh, among Christians and, and in the greater Blacksburg community. So it is a joy to welcome you as a brother here at the body of Christ at Blacksburg UMC. Thank you. Yeah. Welcome. And invite those of you joining us to welcome Mike through the chat and post your words of gratitude and of hospitality to him. Go to the Lord in prayer. Let's remember all of those who are on our prayer list. Those concerns on our hearts that are known only to each of us and God. Let's remember those who are receiving medical care and those who are in a season of grief, especially Brenda Juby and her family on the death of her husband, David. Brenda is Laura Hefta's sister. Holding these and others in heart, please join me in praying the prayer of St. Francis. Let us pray. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. And where there is sadness, joy. O Divine Master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, and it's in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it's in dying that we are born to eternal life. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those 
who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. following our worship experience today, you're invited to join Pastor Brad and me for an after-worship Zoom chat. You can find the Zoom link in the chat on YouTube Live. We look forward to connecting with you. Go in peace, putting faith in action, this day and every day. Amen. Amen.